This is CNN and Fortune. It's the hottest investment around. Thousands of miles of paradise. Imagine being a golfer. Hundreds of resort hotels to be. My boat will fit in here. My boat will fit in here. We may have to cut a few ends off it, but it'll be here. But you won't find any Americans involved. Are Americans missing the boat? Well, they're not missing the boat. They're being held back from the dock. Tonight, this Pied Piper shows you what Uncle Sam is missing. In the end, I am a raving capitalist. David Mattingly on an island of profit. CNN and Fortune with Will Obey and Stephen Frazier. Welcome to CNN and Fortune. Tonight, I'm at Old Town News in Alexandria, Virginia. And I'm at Barnes & Noble Astor Place newsstand in New York City. Our first stop tonight, a different island, Cuba, where the welcome mat is out for big business. Although Americans have been shut out by the U.S. embargo, Cuba's been open to international investment for a decade. Since then, it's estimated that the country has attracted more than $2 billion in foreign capital. David Mattingly introduces us to a developer who's pouring millions into the country because he believes Cuba is an investor's paradise. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tropicana, the paradise under the stars. Through a revolution, a missile crisis, the decades of a Cold War, the doors of Havana's legendary Tropicana never closed. And today, the high energy shows are burning as brightly as ever. Cubans report visitors from all over the world are coming to join the party like never before. And among them, a big money investor named Wally Barakoff is rekindling opportunities that are leading to the business deals of a lifetime. So the driver that comes down Avenue 1 will have access only to the marina, the Miramar Hotel, and our hotel complex here. Perfect. That's what we want. Yeah, that's what we want. Barakoff is mapping out the details of a 10-year, $400 million investment. He's a venture capitalist with international companies in mining and real estate. But nothing he's done compares to what he plans to do in Cuba. Who exactly are you competing with? In this, uh, in this type of development, there isn't very much competition here in the Caribbean. Uh, in Cuba, there is no competition for this type of development. In this communist country not known for its luxury, Barakoff has been granted the rights to develop four beachfront resorts and build 11 first-class hotels. Here, it's not yet built on. This is the last opportunity that I know in the Western world where someone could come like myself, see this paradise, and say, I can develop it. A developer's dream, Barakoff plans to build his largest resort on a secluded beach 45 minutes outside Havana. For Russian tourists once played in the sand, Barakov sees timeshare communities and six sprawling first-class hotels. Imagine being a golfer. You're up on the cliff and you're teeing off. You're right on the edge. Along the spectacular cliffs, he's planning the island's first championship golf course, a polo field and a guest ranch. In the surf, there will be a port for cruise ships and for smaller vessels, a freshwater marina. Do I have a boat? Yes. And of course, your boat will be able to fit My in here. My boat will fit in here. My boat will fit in here. We may have to cut a few ends off it, but it'll be here. When he's done, be Barakoff will have turned this quiet cove into Cuba's first playground for the world's travel elite and the millions they have to spend. In the end, I am a raving capitalist. I think I've said that to you, and certainly I've said that to the Cubans. And uh, they like my brand of capitalism, and that's what I'm doing here. What Barakov is doing is importing capital and management expertise. He will split the profits of his resorts with Cuban developers who share in the expenses and provide the skilled labor. This is the area for the South Gulf course. And while Barakov builds his resorts, his closest and biggest competitors can't touch him. Barakov, you see, is Canadian, and his company, Leisure Canada, is not subject to the long-standing embargo that keeps most U.S. businesses off the island. Are Americans missing the boat? So they're not missing the boat. They're being held back from the dock. And as American companies wait for their ship to sail, they are left out of what could be the biggest business boom in Cuba since the 1950s. Cuban officials are banking heavily on the allure of their country's colonial beauty and revolutionary history. 
they enticed a reported 1.4 million visitors in 1998 with miles of pristine beaches, the landscape of the countryside, and a way of life that often seems frozen in time. And that's really what's kept me in Cuba. It's the people. It's the, it's the culture. Uh, these people have a, have a need to succeed. They have a direction. Uh, and it's wonderful to be on the same train heading in the same direction. And it is a new direction for Cubans as tourism is emerging as one of its main sources of badly needed hard currency, generating $1.8 billion, according to government figures in 1998. Now growing four times faster than that of its Caribbean neighbors, Cuban tourism could become a way out of one of the island's darkest economic periods. When the icons of communism came tumbling down, Cuba watched billions in subsidies and its biggest trade partner, the Soviet Union, disappear. Thrown into a crippling economic depression, shortages erupted in food, medicine, and fuel. Fidel Castro then agreed to economic reforms, legalizing foreign currencies like the U.S. dollar. And he turned to new business partners like the Canadians, opening the door for Wally Barakov. Hey, here we go. All right, man. Barakov came to Cuba in 1992 and found a host of Cuban partners eager to profit from his Western style of business. Did they have any reservations at all about doing business with a Canadian company? None whatsoever. Uh, Canadians here are welcomed with open arms and uh, are respected. And I think part of the reason is that uh, Canadians respect the Cubans. Acting on a tip he picked up from business contacts in Russia, he opened the first new mine in Cuba since the revolution and struck gold and copper. I can tell you, Lewis, if the vault's not big enough, I'll bring you another vault, all right? <laughs> in the years that followed, Barakov sought out other ways of making money in Cuba, and today, with his mining and planned resort deals, he joins 343 other companies from around the world, signing joint ventures with the Cuban government. There are a lot of people who consider joint ventures like this, risky business. Is it risky? I've never had the Cubans uh, ever uh, change the rules on me halfway through. Uh, the regulations are the regulations, and they stick to the deals that they make. Carlos Fernandez de Cosio is head of North American Affairs for the Cuban Foreign Ministry. High above the skyline of a now bustling Havana, he explains Cuba is moving ahead without its closest neighbor different to what might be the perception in the United States. Cuba is not a country closed to the rest of the world. It's closed only to the United States. Closed to the United States because of the 37-year-old embargo signed by President Kennedy that prohibits American businesses from trading with Cuba. There are, however, exemptions in the embargo that give access to some businesses and interaction, including telecommunication companies like AT&T, religious and humanitarian missions, sporting events, American artists and entertainers, and news organizations like CNN. You just look at the map, you see how close this island is to the shores of the United States. The proximity makes us natural partners. Peter Blythe is president of Radisson Hotels, among dozens of American companies watching the success of investors like Barakoff and waiting for the embargo to be lifted. We're enviable of the fact that he's moving ahead, but fortunately, there is a great, more, a great deal more opportunity uh, lying on that island. Opportunity, Blight says, because Cuba has more coastline than all other Caribbean islands combined. And Radisson Hotels has discussed plans with the Cubans to develop three hotels when the embargo is lifted. So they realize that this is a big fish, and if they could land this big fish for their tourism business on the island of Cuba, it would really be a win-win situation. So they are very anxious for us to get started. They've identified these opportunities. We've made a plan with them as to how we would go ahead and get these uh, hotels operating. Um, they see no reason why we couldn't start business tomorrow. <laughs> but of course, we understand that we have to be uh, patient and we have to wait until it's legal to do so. But Blythe says Radisson's plans in Cuba won't last forever. Because investors from other countries are moving in. For the first time since the revolution, investors from Europe, Mexico, and Canada are building new hotels on Cuba's vast stretches of white sand beaches. And in old Havana, where buildings are crumbling from years of neglect, investors are restoring a lost elegance to turn-of-the-century hotels, renewing Havana's claim to the title of Paris of the Caribbean. 
The U.S. State Department looks upon all this business activity in Cuba with skepticism. U.S. officials say that the Cuban government estimates on the amount of international investment are greatly exaggerated. They also believe that the economic reforms we see in Cuba reflect no true change on the part of the Cuban government. Look, people have been doing business with the Castro government for uh, 40 years, in effect. The business activity in Cuba is not new, though it has increased recently. Uh, none of that business uh, activity has brought about uh, any fundamental change in the Cuban system, in any sense. Michael Rannenberger oversees Cuban policy for the U.S. State Department. The United States hopes to achieve democratic reform by isolating and depriving the Castro government of economic resources. By the very nature of the activities that they're doing, they are supporting a repressive regime. Critics in the U.S. say companies in Cuba are profiting at the expense of Cuban citizens who are paid low state wages and denied the right to organize labor. Most Cubans still earn less money than they did 10 years ago, less than the equivalent of $15 a month. This despite an increase in international business activity. None of that has in any way whatsoever affected the Cuban system. It hasn't brought greater rights to workers. It hasn't brought greater welfare to the Cuban people. It certainly hasn't brought about political or economic change. But Cuban officials defend international investment as a means to protect socialist programs like free education and health care, what they call the victories of the socialist revolution. We have been able to incorporate some elements of capitalism and market economy without challenging the essence of our socialist system. Uh, we've proven that we can do that. We've proven it to ourselves. And we've proven to ourselves that we can continue to do that without challenging the system. But investors in Cuba continue to do business at their own risk. To avoid possible sanctions from the U.S., it took Barakov three years to make sure none of his properties in Cuba belonged to U.S. companies or citizens prior to the revolution. And now other questions are being raised about Cuba's uncertain political future. What will happen in Cuba after Castro? This Solomon Smith Barney ad reflects growing anticipation in the U.S. that the rules in Cuba could soon change, change that could affect Barakoff's future plans, though he doesn't seem to be worried. He predicts his $400 million investment in Cuban tourism to pay off with a 10-year, 600% return. The people that follow will probably have an easier road of it, but I don't think they'll make as much money. That's, that's what I see. No profit without risk, in other words. That's correct. The bigger the risk, we hope, the bigger the profit. And that's always been uh, my motto as an entrepreneur, that's for sure.